Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Tampa Museum of Arts 30 on Thursday program. We are very excited today to hear from Dr. Branko van Oppen about the Amazons. Just a few notes regarding the Zoom webinar that you are in. There's a couple different ways you can participate today. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to send us questions. In the chat function, you are welcome to send comments to just the panelists or to all panelists and all attendees. And if you'd like to ask a question out loud, please don't hesitate to use the raise hand feature also located at the bottom of your screen. When that pops up, I will invite you to unmute yourself so that you can ask your question of Dr. Van Oppen. And with that, I would like to invite Bronco to turn on his screen and introduce today's program. Um, thank you very much, Brittany, and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us today uh, in this uh, very exciting program. Uh, today's 30 on Thursday, we'll look at the Amazons in the Tampa Museum of Art. I will first talk about a spectacular ancient vase in the collection showing two Amazons fighting with Heracles. I will discuss a few of the myths in which the, in which the Amazons played an important role as warrior women especially the so-called Amazona Marquise, that is Greek for uh, combats with the Amazons. And lastly, I will turn to Wonder Woman, the modern day Amazon who has her own place in the ongoing Her Story exhibition at the museum. So this uh, is a black figure vase uh, from Attica, that is of course the region around Athens in Greece, dated to the late 6th century. This is, as you can see from the accession date, one of the very first antiquities acquisitions of the museum. In fact, it's the very second. And it shows us two Amazons in combat against Heracles. Now, this vase is attributed to uh, a group of vase painters named after Leagros. We do not know the real name of this group of people, um, but this is a technical term that scholars use. Um, but what is important about it that is that this is the most significant last generation of late archaic Attic black figure vase painting. So it's very special that we have this in our collection and you can recognize it by the complex overlapping compositions with idealized proportions. And notice also the added white slip. This is not white paint, but white slip to indicate the skin complexion. On the other side of the vase, um, we see a very similar composition where two Greek enemies are fighting over a fallen soldier. Um, the Greek soldiers wear similar heavy armor indicating that you cannot recognize where they are from uh, just by looking at the kind of weapons that they use. Um, but what is interesting here as well is that some of the black figures are not perfectly black and that is due to misfiring in the kiln. But back to the Amazons. In Greek myth, the Amazons were warrior women who lived on the margins of Greek civilization, uh, a tribe of women without any men living their lives devoted to war and hunting uh, and dedicating their lives to the god Ares, the god of war, and Artemis, the god of hunting. Um, geographically, they were thought to live in an area around the Black Sea coast, uh, and uh, beyond. Now, in this myth, uh, I am going to uh, return to this several times over. This mythic tribe uh, of women uh, is used uh, for their foreign customs to represent everything that women should not be. They should not be warriors. They should not be independent, strong, or brave in the Greek mind. We see on this vase that they are fighting against Heracles. We recognize him by the club, the sword. He's probably having a bow 
uh, or at least quiver with arrows, uh, and particularly the lion scalp that he's wearing over his head and the rest of the lion skin uh, over his body with two legs knotted in front. Heracles is the hero who defends civilization against dangers. Nemean lion, for instance, or in this case, the dangers of warrior women. In his ninth labor out of 12, he was asked by King Aristius of Tyrins, a Mycenaean city, uh, to fetch the girdle of Hippolyta for his daughter Admete. This girdle or belt is a symbol of virginity and chastity. And Hippolyta uh, was the daughter of Queen Otreira of the Amazons, uh, and her father was actually the uh, god, <laughs> the god of war, Ares. This girdle or belt of Hippolyta is an emblem of her warrior status. It's a gift from her father, uh, and again, a symbol of her chastity and her dignity. So this idea of um, representing uh, this girdle that uh, Heracles needs to overcome, you will also uh, recognize some of the sexual overtones here, uh, male violence with Heracles' club and his sword that are masculine weapons and perhaps even uh, phallic symbols. Notice also the skin complexion of the Amazons and their skimpy outfits. So this is also a story of male masculinity, the myth of the superiority uh, of men over women uh, and this is depicted in this uh, vase uh, by Heracles overpowering the fallen Amazon. Uh, and the hand gesture in Greek uh, vase paintings signifies subjugation. But uh, thanks to Brittany's observation, we can notice that the left hand is actually the wrong way around. The thumb is at the wrong side of the hand. And I'm wondering, is this an epic fail? Or is this an actual subtle subversion by the painter to wink, wink, nudge, nudge, uh, as indicate that perhaps women were more significant uh, than the myth wants us to believe? It was a very popular theme, um, the importance of subjugation, the othering of people of different uh, ethnicities, of different cultures, and in this case also of different uh, gender. Uh, and interestingly, the museum has a fragment that is attributed to the same Liagros group, uh, that is a gift uh, from our dear patron, uh, Bill Zawatsky. Uh, here, the Amazon is actually riding on horseback um, uh, and carrying lances in her hands. Now, I mentioned the Amazon of Maquis. There are sev several myths in which the Amazons fight against Greek heroes. Uh, here you see a, a red figure vase from southern Italy, Apulia, dated to the late fourth century, a gift of Mr. and Mrs. Salmon, where a warrior theme is repeated and combined with uh, stories of the life of Dionysus. Um, you can see on the front side three scenes. Uh, at the top is the Amazon Maquis, uh, unfortunately not preserved uh, perfectly. Then in the middle, the death of Semele by the lightning strikes of Zeus, and underneath the birth of Dionysus attended by Hermes. And Dionysus, of course, is the child of Semele with Zeus. On the other side, that uh, you might see over here in the Her Story exhibition, um, there is the marriage of Dionysus with uh, the love of his life, Ariadne, and an Oscan warrior with horse in a funerary shrine. So this is a funerary scene uh, in honor of a warrior, uh, a fallen soldier, uh, and all these themes referring to Dionysus uh, must hint at a blessed life in uh, after death, uh, just as Dionysus was in a way uh, reborn after his mother had died, 
Uh, so this Oscan warrior was uh, given this vase in the hopes that he might have a blessed afterlife. Um, the Amazona Marquis uh, repeat, uh, reoccurs several times in our collection. Um, here is a, a nice little Lekithos from the noble collection uh, where heroes are fighting against Amazon, Amazons. We see uh, Heracles here again with his lion scalp over his head and a club in his hands. Uh, and he's fighting with uh, three uh, Greek warriors against the Amazons. And you see one fallen and another on her knees. Um, and also notice that uh, one of the three Amazons has a so-called Phrygian cap on the far right. A Phrygian cap does not necessarily mean that the Amazons were considered Phrygian. Uh, it's a, a term that we use uh, without really knowing how the Greeks called it, but it, re it reoccurs uh, whenever Greeks want to point out uh, that the figure is uh, foreign, oriental, or barbarian. And so this is a a scene that demonstrates not only the superiority of men over women, but also, also the cultural superiority of Greeks over barbarians. And this theme was politically very important. Uh, it even appears on the famous Parthenon friezes on the Athenian Acropolis. Now remember that this building commemorated the victory over the Persians when the building was uh, rebuilt during the time of Pericles, a time of political ascendancy for Athens, a time uh, when uh, uh, democracy uh, came to uh, its full extent. And the uh, relief scenes on the so-called metopes, an architectural element, show, uh, among others, the gigantomachy, where uh, the Greek gods are fighting against the giants, the kentauromachy, where uh, Greek heroes fight against the Kentaurs, also uh, figures of chaos and danger. On the west facade, unfortunately rather poorly preserved, uh, was an Amazonomachy. And on the north facade uh, was probably the sack of Troy. See how from religious uh, combat scenes to uh, mythic or legendary com combat scenes, we come to uh, this political significance. This is Greek culture fighting against its enemies, legendary mythic combats that give an expression of Athenian or at least Greek dominance. Uh, that it was a popular theme, uh, we can also illustrate with relief scenes from the Temple of Apollo in Arcadia, uh, an area on the um, Peloponnese uh, to the northwest of Sparta. Here you see on the relief scenes, uh, also again, a Kentauromachy, uh, an Amazonomachy at the, uh, with Heracles as the main figure and an Amazonomachy during the time of the Trojan War. Um, interestingly, these relief scenes were dedicated by the city of Figalia, a city in Arcadia, as a thanksgiving for delivering the city from the plague. Uh, and this is relevant because Apollo is both the god of plagues and he is the god of healing. Uh, and perhaps some of you may know that around or about this time, the plague also ravished Athens and um, caused the death of Pericles. So the, that plague was very significant. They thanked uh, Apollo for saving them from that, uh, but they do so with this very mythic and political uh, relief scenes. Uh, so uh, during the Trojan Wars, the Amazonians were believed to have allied with the Trojans, that means against the Greeks, uh, and then the sister of Hippolyta, Queen Penthesilea, uh, Penthesilea uh, excuse me, uh, joined the Amazonians and was ultimately killed by Achilles. So here, this theme of heroism uh, of Greek warriors uh, is again an expression of overcoming foreign foes 
who happen to also be warrior women. Um, notice also that in these scenes, uh, Amazons can wear the Phrygian cap. These relief scenes come from the mausoleum, the funerary monument or royal sepulcher uh, that commemorated the death of King Mausolos of Halicarnassus who in the early century. On the scenes uh, that Amazons, we again see the Greek heroes combating the warrior women and the Phrygian cap, especially on the lower left, emphasized the fact that these women were foreigners, orientals, or uh, even barbarians. Um, now, in the Her Story exhibition, my colleagues, Brittany and Cassandra, have also shown uh, the contemporary relevance of the Amazons because Wonder Woman is, uh, of course, a modern day comic, but considered to be an Amazonian. Uh, so the relevance of antiquity for our modern and contemporary society is illustrated nicely uh, with these scenes from Wonder Woman. Uh, Wonder Woman is in the comic strip, a princess called Diana of uh, Themyscira, an Amazonian uh, and indeed the daughter of Queen Hippolyta. She joins the Justice Society of America to fight Nazism in the man's world. Her abilities and her arsenal include super strength, the lasso of truth, uh, projectile bracelets, and also mental powers. Um, the creation of Wonder Woman is actually quite interesting too. Uh, the uh, creator's name or the uh, author's name is William Marston, but he wrote under the pen name Charles Moulton. Uh, the artist uh, who drew Wonder Woman, uh, often uncredited, was Harry Peter, but it is said that the inspiration for Wonder Woman came from Marston's wife, Elizabeth, and their life partner, uh, Olive Byrne. It was very deliberately intended to be feminist propaganda to show a modern day role woman, uh, uh, role model for, uh, for women, um, but at the same time, uh, we have to admit that this Wonder Woman was sexualized with themes of bondage and submission. She first appeared in um, the All-Star comic um, of October 1941, um, and the episode is called Introducing Wonder Woman, and uh, very shortly after in Sensation Comics of January 42, uh, the first full-length Wonder Woman story appeared. She's a freedom fighter. She fights for justice, democracy, but also for womankind. So Wonder Woman uh, and the Amazonians in general are here seen as proto-feminists who live in a land without man on Paradise Island. Um, the, the Wonder Woman story picks this up, uh, emphasizes it even that living without man is like living in paradise. Wonder Woman is a role model. She is semi-divine with supernatural power, beautiful as Aphrodite, wise as Athena, quick as Hermes, and strong as Hercules. Um, but at the same time, she falls in love with a uh, human mortal, Steve Trevor, and uh, the story also has elements of the, therefore, the domestication of women. Uh, she becomes uh, mortal, she falls in love, uh, and falls under the power of men. So, um, what I have very quickly tried to illustrate today is how ancient art, ancient culture, ancient history remain profoundly relevant for us today. Uh, I hope that um, you will continue to patronage us at the TMA and to wander around the museum 
wonder about the ancient, modern, and also contemporary art on display and feel connected in your own personal way with these objects. Um, I went a little faster today than I had intended, um, but um, I hope that you enjoyed. And if you do have any questions, uh, of course, please feel free uh, and let us know. You can type in a comment, raise your hand uh, to ask a question. Uh, please let me know. I actually do see a raised hand. Um, Brittany, are you there? Oh, yep, yeah, but it looks like the hand went down. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, there it is and again. Okay. back up again. <laughs> yep. Um, Barbara, I am allowing you to talk. Go ahead and unmute yourself to ask your question. I was really interested in the Parthenon. The, the, if you could say a bit more about why of the four markers of the Parthenon giving them such impact and import, uh, the M M how the Amazon has a whole side dedicated to it. So say a little more about that as a, as a, a, a I can't find the right word, not prototype, not archetype, but one of the four powers or principles mm -hmm. of something like that and how that relates to the power of those ideas within that democracy or culture or whatever. Um, yeah, it's uh, something that is very fascinating that it became such a popular theme to express uh, a Greek superiority over foreigners. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, that I want to say that it is racist, um, but there is a certain uh, ethnocentrism expressed in this. And because the Amazons are also women, there is also an element of um, male superiority expressed uh, in these. Um, in the Greek mind, there are, let's say, uh, generations in um, in the mythical times. So there was the time before Zeus became uh, king of the Olympian gods. In order for him to establish his power, they needed to overcome the uh, the giants. So the gigantomachia is the combat against the giants that ruled before Zeus took over. Um, then there are these. Uh, half human, half animal creatures like the Kentaurs that needed to be overcome. That was the next uh, kind of um, sort of cosmic combat that had to be fought. So now um, uh, these wild animals that Heracles also has to, sub has to subdue um, uh, are taken care of. So you see how there is this kind of progress from fighting against other gods to fighting against wild animals or half human, half animal uh, monsters. And then um, the next step is to overcome foreign powers. So the Amazons are one and the Trojans in the Greek mind are others. And uh, it is not probably an accident that the Trojans live right across from the Aegean. Uh, in other words, uh, this is the, the, the logic that now the Athenians have also overcome the Persians. That's the new generation. So now we have overcome the Persians. In the past, the Greeks have overcome the Trojans. Before that, the Amazons, and so on. Do you see the kind of yes. Greek logic behind this? Beautiful. Um, I see all sorts of red balloons. <laughs> yes. Uh, we got a question in the Q&A asking um, if there will be a way to see the recorded version again, because the presentation was brilliant and interesting, but the information went by very quickly. So yeah, yes, I, we... <laughs> it, it was not my intention to talk so fast. Uh, um, the, apologies for that. But yes, Brittany uh, uh, was about to say. Uh, yes, it is we are available on Facebook. 
we are recording the program and uh, once I edit out the beginning so that people watching it for the recording don't have to sit through the PowerPoint that started us off, uh, I will upload it to YouTube and Facebook. So the museum's YouTube channel as well as our Facebook and I will put the links to both of those in the chat if you want to click on them before we close out today's program it'll open the window and later today or early tomorrow those um, will be available there we did have some problems with the facebook live stream so we were not able to go live today so uh, does anyone else have questions comments thoughts to share uh, yes 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 I don't know how to do this. I wondered about whether there's a fourth level because in looking at how we would, uh, this is a kind of universal uh, uh, model of how a culture develops and overcomes its uh, enemies, whatever they mm -hmm. are, or conscious, mm -hmm. unconscious, whatever. So did the Greeks, because they were a republic finally, did the Greeks uh, politically get past the uh, Amazonian and, and barbarian to um, another level? What's the fourth wall? And how would that relate then to the question of, of, of politics as we see them and we study them often within the Greek tradition? Um, if I understand your question correctly, then historically, um, shortly after the death of Alexander the Great, uh, suddenly the Celts came from Central Europe into the Greek world. They even plundered uh, the temple of Apollo at Delphi. And uh, in that period, uh, the very late uh, third century and the early second century, the Gauls became the new enemy. And so you will find relief scenes where they are fighting against goals uh, compared with uh, the Amazon Marquis, the Kentauro Marquis. And so there, there will be a fourth or, or even a fifth uh, part of the story added. Um, interestingly, the Persians never get these kinds of, of scenes. There are a couple of scenes of Greeks fighting or interacting with Persians, but not in the same kind of mythical level. Um, um, but I'm not exactly sure if that answers your question, Barbara. Yes, it does. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It does. All right. So with that, everybody, thank you so much, Franco, for this presentation. As I said, we will be uploading it so you can watch it later. I have put the links to the museum's YouTube channel, as well as Facebook page and our events page. So if you're interested in more events like this one, be sure to open your chat and click those links before we end the program. And with that, um, I think I am going to end it, but thank you so much, everybody, for attending this afternoon. We look forward to seeing you again at our next event. 30 on Thursday event on June 10th, when our curator of modern and contemporary art, Joanna Rabotham, will be talking about our exhibition, Her World in Focus. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bronco. Thank you.